Um, David, you had that terrific piece in The Times with others about North Korea in which you point out um, something I suppose we, we re uh, uh, should have realized, which is North Korea has an incredibly advanced cyber warfare capacity. They can steal bank accounts, they can shut down movie studios, they can, uh, you know, uh, do uh, presumably attack the power grid. Um, is this a part of our realizing that North Korea is much more sophisticated? Because a lot of what seems to have surprised people is the speed with which they have been able to acquire nuclear. Is it because they have a pretty sophisticated scientific establishment? Well, certainly they have a more sophisticated scientific establishment. And while we had a pretty good sense from the early 80s uh, of the development of their nuclear capacity, I think it's fair to say that uh, American intelligence was taken a bit by surprise in the speed of which it has done uh, the missile uh, improvements over the past few years. And if you go back as early as, uh, as late as 2009, there was pretty much a consensus that they were kind of nowhere in the world of cyber. And they have come way up the line there. So why is this scary? What's, what's concerning about this? In nuclear, we understand the deterrent effect. If they lob a nuclear weapon at the United States, the state of North Korea is gone an hour later. Cyber is different. While nuclear is on an on-off switch, cyber is on a thermostat. <laughs> you can move it up, you can move it down, and their attacks so far against Sony, uh, against South Korea, uh, the use of uh, a new weapon that they called WannaCry that devastated the British health system was based in part on a web, on a vulnerability stolen from the National Security Agency in and, the United States. And, and Norman, the problem is you can't attribute them. The Russians still deny that they, you know, that they were involved in the election. It's unlike nuclear, where you can see where the missile came from. With cyber warfare, how do you deter somebody when they can claim it, it wasn't me? Well, absolutely. And indeed, the whole concept of, po of developing a policy of deterrence against a cyber actor is very, very difficult. It's not only you don't necessarily know whence the attack came, but even if it is attributed, that can be a false attribution. Iran's attacks against the United States, as reported in the press, uh, have touched upon the financial industry, have touched upon possibly a casino in the United States, have touched upon infrastructure in the United States. Iran so is, Iran has a pretty... Iran is developing a significant cyber program, and it has escaped much public notice. It is also uh, something that is part of Iran's asymmetric, unconventional response pattern, and I believe represents a serious threat to the region as well as to the United States. What does this tell us? Your book is about these new kinds of threats that are either non-state or partially state, uh, non-attributable. So these are network threats. I mean, they're, they're like terrorism threats that the hackers uh, and the cyber in general relies on networks and you have to counter it with networks. We actually, after North Korea attacked Sony, I don't know what we did, but but we certainly uh, there was evidence that the Obama administration uh, responded and it doesn't uh, get reported. But ultimately, we have to it's it's really about building network defenses and you have to do that with private companies and even civic groups and the government together. It's not like nuclear where it's government to government. It's where you need all different parts of society in defensive networks. Are you optimistic we'll be able to get get there? I don't think we have much choice, but I mean, the future of war in so many ways is about controlling the information space. Uh, and that's going to be the, the difference is we're not going to see much of that. It's not like, you know, building your traditional forts or tanks. Um, it's it's again, network versus network. And a lot of it is is not going to be reported. But I think we have to get there. I think that the, the, the key challenge, it seems to me, is to be able to do this with allies, with partners. I mean, the, the, the whole idea in this new world of going it alone seems much more difficult. Absolutely. In fact, you need to have uh, a deep partnerships, not only on how to handle Iran's nuclear program through the JCPOA nuclear deal, but on developing cyber defenses, developing ballistic missile defenses. And this requires working very closely with our very good friends in the Gulf Cooperation Council, as well as with the European Union, as well as with the United Nations to develop protocols and formats to work this. All right. David, let me start with you on the Niger issue. It seems to me we've gotten confused with this uh, apologies and non apologies The real issue, it seems to me, is we still don't really know what American troops were doing in Niger. Oh, we don't, Fareed, and we also don't know exactly what 
the strategic objective they're trying to accomplish is. And I think that's what's made this such a difficult conversation. As you say, it's gotten lost in the question of the apologies and, and what the president said and now what, the, what his chief of staff has said. But the bigger issue is we have um, reportedly 800 uh, uh, troops uh, in Niger. We have many others uh, around Africa. We're conducting operations, mostly advise and train operations, but clearly they get into some combat rules, roles. And one thing I think this administration has been quite poor at, the Obama administration wasn't much better, sort of sitting down and explaining to the American people why a president who ran on getting us out of small wars around the world where we were taking casualties still has them in there. There's a very good, compelling rationale for them to be there, but he hasn't offered it which makes it all the more painful when you hear stories like the one of this, these four tragic deaths this week. And Norman, it seems to me that the danger here is if you're in, it's one thing if you're in a country like Afghanistan where, and I know this is going to sound strange, but they actually have a legitimate government. It has reasonable control over large parts of the country. Um, once you're dealing with Niger, Mali, Chad, the, 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 there's almost tribal warfare going on continuously and the danger of some kind of miscalculation, falling in with the wrong tribal leader becomes quite large. Well, that's true, but I think it's also important to recognize that this is a good use of American power. We are enabling partners in very dangerous parts of the world to do things that will, inevi that will inevitably protect the United States. It will prevent Al-Qaeda and the Maghreb and ISIS from establishing themselves in areas where they could proliferate their malign activity and threaten the homeland. And is the fear here that as they get squeezed in Iraq, this is where they're going to end up? I think it's a very legitimate fear that, fear that as they are squeezed in Iraq and Syria that they will spread to those parts of the world where they can conduct their activities, training in particular and leadership in particular. So you need to worry about Yemen, you need to worry about uh, North Africa in order to ensure that this doesn't become another a hotbed of planning against the homeland. Do you think this could be could be explained better, or do you do you do you buy that? I do, but I, I actually think exactly that 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 the terrorists move to ungoverned spaces. So by definition, then you don't have a legitimate government with control of the space, and you're going to have these kinds of incidents. But I agree with David that we need to say. We're in a new kind of conflict. There's no battle and we win and we lose. It's a continually shifting battlefield. And we have to be there preferably before uh, a new branch of Al-Qaeda or ISIS can take root. Iran deal, David, what is the most likely? The, the president has not just raised the stakes, but now we have a kind of ticking bomb. He has said, I'm going to throw this over to Congress and Congress has to do something. Otherwise, I'm going to withdraw. What, what happens in Congress? Well. The most likely outcome with Congress, as with almost everything else we've seen this year, is that they do nothing. And it's something that they've proven they do pretty well. <laughs> right? um, but there is the possibility that they may try to set some triggers, as the president has suggested, where if Iran takes certain activity, it would then reimpose sanctions. Now, of course, if we reimpose sanctions unilaterally, that could violate the nuclear deal and thus get Iran out of the nuclear deal. I think one of the, the big issues uh, that comes out of all of this is, do we want to be in the position where the United States is the first one to openly violate the terms of the deal? Not the spirit of the deal, as the president was talking about, but its actual words and paragraphs. And if we did that, I think the Iranians would have a big talking point. And I've already had many European diplomats who've come through Washington in the past couple of weeks say to me that they're very fearful of this because if that happens, they're going to separate from the U.S. They're actually going to side with the Iranians. Yeah. Norman, what, you, you were the lead Iran analyst. You coordinated all this. What, what should we do about Iran? Well, I think we should recognize there are four pieces to this. The Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action deal did exactly what it was supposed to do. It reversed Iranian nuclear program, it placed them under extraordinary international supervision. That's a good thing. But 
Iran's malign activity in the region tells us we have to do more. And I believe this was recognized by uh, Secretary Kerry even at the time of the deal. Iran's missile program is unreasonably large, and they're starting, as Secretary Tillerson has stated, to deploy this uh, technology in very bad ways with proxies in the region. Finally, you have to think, if you're dealing with, a, with, a, with an adversary that is engaged in such uh, malign activity, where do you see them leading their nuclear program in 10 years? And for this reason, I think it's appropriate to look at the Iran policy framework right now and decide where do we take it from this, from this point. But wouldn't the answer then be, pocket the gains from the, from the uh, nuclear deal and focus on the other stuff rather than relitigating the nuclear deal? Absolutely. We need to keep JCPOA in my view because of the benefits it brings. We need to look at certain elements of the deal and see if they need to be extended. It's important to note that in October of 2020, uh, the restrictions on Iran's conventional military program will go away. Is that a good thing for the region, that Iran is able to acquire advanced conventional technology? In October of 2023, the con restrictions on Iran's mil uh, missile program go away. Is it a good thing that Iran's missile program falls away from uh, United Nations oversight? I don't think so. But I think that's a dialogue that should take place with Congress and the administration. And most importantly, a bipartisan, calm response should be placed forward. And we you know, I don't disagree with the what here. I mean, the, the, that Iran is behaving badly in the region, but I deeply disagree with the how. Mm. And indeed, the president's own national security team, General Mattis, uh, General McMaster, they agree on the value of the JPOA. And the way we should be doing this is both with Congress, but also with our allies. I mean, as David mm. says, splitting ourselves off from the Europeans and allowing the Russians and others to say, you violated the agreement is exactly the opposite of what we should be doing. We need to, as, as we've done successfully before, point others to what, where Iran is misbehaving in the region and have a coalition that can, can put pressure on them. All right, we have uh, take a break. When we Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico's economy was foundering before Hurricane Maria. Now the whole island is devastated. We have a plan to save it, to make Puerto Rico great again when we come back. Now for our What in the World segment. On September 25th, with Puerto Rico still devastated from Hurricane Maria, Donald Trump tweeted that Texas and Florida are doing great, but Puerto Rico, which was already suffering from broken infrastructure and massive debt, is in deep trouble. Now, I know that tweet might sound a bit graceless in the face of such devastation, but on this one, on the issue, Donald Trump is right. Puerto Rico was an economic basket case before the storm. And I think there might actually be a silver lining here for the people of Puerto Rico. Hurricane Maria may offer the single greatest opportunity to rebuild the island, but it will take a grand bargain to pull it off. Let's look at some of the numbers. Puerto Rico's economy has actually been contracting, contracting by roughly 1.5% a year for the last 10 years. Puerto Ricans have been fleeing the island to look for better opportunities on the mainland. And that creates a vicious circle. A smaller population means a declining tax base, which makes it even more difficult for the local Puerto Rican government to pay back its debt. That debt rang in at about $43 billion in 2007 and reached about $64 billion in 2016. Hurricane Maria just adds even more uncertainty to Puerto Rico's deteriorating fiscal prospects. And who's to blame for this mess? Well, there are a lot of candidates. On the federal level, Congress passed legislation back in the 1980s denying Puerto Rico the ability that every other state has to declare bankruptcy, thus limiting its financial options. Only recently did that change to some degree. On the local level, weak fiscal discipline by government officials helped fuel the island's rising debt level. It's worth noting that one of Puerto Rico's chief sources of income, tourism, has been flat over the past 10 years. Puerto Rico's tourism industry grew annually by only 1%, while the Dominican Republic, Aruba, Jamaica, and Cuba grew between 3 and 5%. So what can be done? Well, I would propose a kind of grand bargain. The federal government needs to bring something to the table, as do the good people of Puerto Rico, who have been through so much. The federal government should commit to a large, multi-year, multi-billion dollar program of investment, it should restructure Puerto Rico's debt, and repair the island's infrastructure. In return, after conditions get normal, the leadership of the Commonwealth should also make some difficult economic reforms. 
Many of these have already been proposed by the eminent economist Ann Kruger, and most are geared to making the island more business friendly in order to bring back jobs, increase the tax base, and stop the outflow of people. Kruger's proposals include reducing the cost of electricity and repealing the Jones Act, which has made shipping goods to the island more expensive. But her most controversial proposal involves lowering the minimum wage, implementing welfare reforms, and lowering benefits to make Puerto Rico more competitive compared with other Caribbean economies. Right now, according to Kruger, the head of a family of three earning minimum wage on the island brings home about $1,100 per month, while that same person could get about $1,700 per month just being on welfare. With the disincentive to work like that, is it any surprise that before the storm, just 40% of Puerto Rican adults were employed or seeking work versus about 63% for the overall U.S. labor force? I know this is tough medicine for an island still struggling to get any sort of medicine. But Puerto Rico has huge potential, and it will only be realized when its economy is properly restructured and the island can provide a promising future for all its residents. Next on GPS, as America withdraws from so many of its roles in the world, China has been filling the vacuum. We learned a lot this week about China's real intentions, thanks to a speech by President Xi Jinping. Hear what he had to say and what it meant when we come back. President Xi Jinping laid out his vision for China's future. He told the more than 3,000 people assembled in that hall that China had entered a new era and it was now a great power and a strong power. China now stands firm and tall in the East, he said. The speech lasted more than three hours, so long that he was served tea in the middle of it. President Xi's remarks kicked off the Communist Party Congress where he will begin his next five-year term. To talk about Xi and China's intentions on the world stage, let me bring in two real experts. Jiayang Fang is a staff writer for The New Yorker who writes frequently about China for the magazine. And Elizabeth Economy is the director of Asia Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, Liz, I have to say this seemed a turning point. I mean, historians might look back because there were two areas where it seemed that Xi Jinping was very assertive. One, that there is, in fact, a Chinese model for development. And he talked openly about how developing countries might want to copy that rather Im implicitly rather than anything Washington tells them. And the second was this idea that China is, I think in his words, center stage on the world right now. Right. And I think that both of those things are emblematic of Xi's Chinese dream, right? It's the rejuvenation of the great Chinese nation. It's the reassertion of the centrality of China on the global stage. Uh, and he's making a move right now. Uh, I would also say that uh, this is somewhat opportunistic, of course, because it happens at a time when the United States is stepping back. Uh, from its traditional role uh, as a global leader, uh, with President Trump, you know, s stepping out of a number of uh, different agreements, and I think Xi Jinping sees it as an opportunity for China to step up and claim center stage. Do you think this is part of a rising kind of Chinese nationalism? Is is what Xi Jinping is saying something that resonates with the Chinese people? I think it very much is part of this growing trend. It probably started even before Xi came on board, but Xi has certainly done his best to harness that sense of belief in the great Chinese civilization and this sense of manifest destiny that China will rise again to the center of the world where it belongs and recover its former glory. I think this sense that China somehow lost what it rightful belonged to the nation and that now is the moment for it to recapture it is very much part of what's animating uh, Xi's philosophy. Talk about Xi as a person. He seems very different. I've had the uh, opportunity to meet him once. Mm -hmm. They normally feel like the Chinese leaders feel like kind of very colorless technocrats. Right. She seems more like a politician. He quotes right. poetry. He makes, you know, analogies. He's always talking about the common Chinese person. And he seems ambitious in a way that a politician is. Do you think, um, first, is that true? And do you think he'll therefore go for that third term that everyone wonders about, which would break with what has become a, a precedent, I think is almost legally enshrined, two terms 
uh, and you're out. Right. Well, I'll answer your first question first. And I think your instinct um, is absolutely right that that confidence that he asserts is very, very evident, especially compared to his predecessors. And I think that comes from his status as a princeling. He was, he is the son of a very prominent Communist Party member who served in the government, um, you know, was banished at one time and then came back. So I think there's that natural authority that his predecessors, his immediate predecessors, did not have. And I think that makes him a little bit more relaxed when it comes to dealing with his peers and counterparts. And also, he has seen the benefits of having greater charisma. I think he is astute in learning from foreign leaders and seeing how um, the more engaging ones can occupy a better place on the global stage. So Liz, what does all this mean for the United States? Uh, well, I think the United States um, faces a real challenge with Xi Jinping, particularly now uh, as we have stepped back. Um, but I think there's some untapped opportunities as well. Uh, if China wants to be a leader, it needs to step up to the plate and begin to forge global agreements on things like uh, the problem with the refugees in Myanmar, which is, you know, right in its backyard. And we don't yet see China playing that kind of role. So she has taken advantage uh, of the fact that we've stepped back to at least rhetorically uh, insert China. Uh, uh, in a global leadership wouldn't, position. Wouldn't the Chinese say, well, but that's a Western conception of what it means to be a global leader. We, the Chinese, believe much more in letting states do what they want, not interfering in other countries. In other words, isn't it partly that he's attacking the very idea of a Western order? Well, I think, I think there are two different things. You know, he has not said agreements to address global challenges. In fact, he said the opposite, that he does want China to play an important role in addressing these challenges. Uh, what he does say, though, and you're right here, is that he doesn't believe that other countries should interfere in the domestic politics uh, of other countries. So uh, that's part of the primacy of sovereignty. And he does uh, put forward another view in terms of collective security, saying that uh, the U.S.-led uh, alliance system uh, is is something that has not proved particularly helpful to the international system and instead you should have this new you know community of common destiny or shared futures uh, which is really not much more than uh, basically calling for the dismantlement of the US led global order so he is calling for that he is calling for that but he's not saying that China won't lead on global issues fascinating discussion we will continue to follow it and we will have you both back to talk about it because a lot of what seems to have surprised people is the speed with which they have been able to acquire nuclear. Is it because they have a pretty sophisticated scientific establishment? Well, certainly they have a more sophisticated scientific establishment. And while we had a pretty good sense from the early 80s uh, of the development of their nuclear capacity, I think it's fair to say that uh, American intelligence was taken a bit by surprise in the speed of which it has done uh, the missile uh, improvements over the past few years. And if you go back as early as, uh, as late as 2009, there were um, David, you had that terrific piece in the Times with others about North Korea in which you point out um, something I suppose we, we re uh, uh, should have realized, which is North Korea has an incredibly advanced cyber warfare capacity. They can steal bank accounts, they can shut down movie studios, they can, uh, you know, uh, do uh, presumably attack the power grid. Um, is this a part of our realizing that North Korea is much more sophisticated? Called WannaCry that devastated the British health system was based in part on a web, on a vulnerability stolen from the National Security Agency in and, the United and, States. And Norman, the problem is you can't attribute them. The Russians still deny that they, you know, that they were involved in the election. It's unlike nuclear, where you can see where the missile came from. With cyber warfare, how do you deter somebody when they can claim it, it wasn't me? Well, absolutely. And indeed, the whole concept of, of developing a policy of deterrence against a cyber actor is very, very difficult. It's not only you don't necessarily know whence the attack came, but even if it was pretty much a consensus that they were kind of nowhere in the world of cyber, and they have come way up the line there. So why is this scary? What's, what's concerning about this? 
In nuclear, we understand the deterrent effect. If they lob a nuclear weapon at the United States, the state of North Korea is gone an hour later. Cyber is different. While nuclear is on an on-off switch, cyber is on a thermostat. <laughs> you can move it up, you can move it down, and their attacks so far against Sony, uh, against South Korea, uh, the use of uh, a new weapon that they... It is attributed, that can be a false attribution. Iran's attacks against the United States, as reported in the press, uh, have touched upon the financial industry, have touched upon possibly a casino in the United States, have touched upon infrastructure in the United States. Iran... So is, Iran has a pretty... Iran is developing a significant cyber program, and it has escaped much public notice. It is also uh, something that is part of Iran's asymmetric, unconventional response pattern, and I believe represents a serious threat to the region as well as to the United States. What does this tell us? Your book is about these new kinds of threats that are either non-state or partial.